Good morning and welcome. Three weeks ago, we started looking at the history of English Bible translations. And this might not be a, a normal sermon. I know some of you weren't here, so uh, you'll just have to bear with us. We looked at basically the history of the English Bible translations up onto the, tra- the translation of the King James Version. So today we're going to not be looking so much at the history, but we'll take a little bit of a look at sort of the, the, the philosophy of, of Bible translations, the different styles, and hopefully understand a little bit more some of the translations that, have, that are more recent than that. I would like to also have this be a little bit more interactive too. I would like to hear your questions, your thoughts, your input, so please feel free to jump in and share what you would have to share. There's... The Bible doesn't talk a lot about the Bible. It assumes it's the Word of God. It's, it's what he shared, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Hebrews 4.12. For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, both of joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So I would like to ask you, when you look at, it talks about the Word of God, what would, what, how would you define the Word of God? God's message. God's message to us. It's true. Yes. Must understand the letter and the spirit. I say all inclusive, but and I'm grappling for uh, more adjectives for that because it starts off where the word of God is living. You look what it all includes. Often, living dies in that process of the different things that are mentioned, uh, judging and getting into the nitty gritty of things. Mm-hmm. But it lives all the way through. And I'm. <laughs> What Yuri said is true. Why does the Bible say the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life? You can't have the spirit without the letter. I think that's going a little beyond the meaning there. Yes. In uh, your prison ministry, Bible. Basic instruction before leaving earth. That's the acronym for the word. Mm-hmm. That's the word is. It's basic instruction. No. Hmm. When I think of the word, I think of the, the written word or the living word. The word of God was made flesh and dwelled among us. So we can, we can know just the written word. Or we can know the living yeah, and I, and I like, I really like what I was hearing. I was sure somebody's going to say the Bible. And I, that, while that is a part of God's word to us, the Bible we have today, I think to say that is the one and only word of God is not really correct. I believe that the word of God includes what God spoke originally. Surprise, surprise. Our English Bibles are not perfect. There are mistakes in every one. And no matter what translation or whatever... And so I think we need to understand the word of God is what God speaks to us personally. That will always align with whatever he has spoken everywhere else. So so we need to to try the spirits. But I think that is really important for us to understand as we go into this, that the word of God encompasses everything that he has spoken, whether it's to us today, whether it's written. But for whatever reason, God didn't choose to allow the exact words in a perfect translation, even even in the original languages, to survive. So, translation is a huge, it's very difficult, and it's full of, of very diffi- 
very difficult things. And one of probably the first thing that might, you might come up, you might think of is sort of what type of translation. And you can go all the way over here from, I don't know if you've ever read an interlinear Bible. It's basically just the words in the order they came in the original languages. It's impossible to really read. It's just... Uh, two things. First of all, what determines the mistakes? And the other thing, for those that want to speak, try to speak up, please. Because All right, it's speak very up. difficult to hear you. You know, John is not far away from me, but I, don't, I didn't hear half the words he said. And right? I will try to repeat okay. back the questions a little bit more, at least summarize them, so that everybody can hear. And I know my ears are turned the opposite direction, you know. I wasn't face-to-face -face with him, but it's, you know, some of us have... Voices that carry, some of us don't. So, but for everybody, I think it's important to try, you know, and participate to speak out so people can can hear what's going on. Yeah, and we'll get into the mistakes a little bit later right, on. We'll we'll, we'll get there. I was a, I had a question. So, how do we say if you say what is the Bible? If I would have said it's some of the messages God gave to us, how would have that come off? <laughs> but, you know, God spoke to people. He spoke to the prophets. Not all of it's recorded, mm -hmm. and we know that, and we believe that. But if we, what if we say, if I were to say, the Bible is a collection of some of the things that God has spoke to mankind? How do we say that that it sounds less cheesy? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I have. I will. How should we say the, the, the Bible is not everything God said to us? Right. That, that can sound pretty pretty sacrilegious, even. I know. I actually like it. <laughs> well, I think the reason probably is that some people have abused that and said, "I have a new revelation that supersedes that," and I think we need to be clear on that. Yes. That and also we'll get into this a little bit more later as far as really the Bible is very accurate. But I think when we co we come down that that what we have today hasn't changed a bit. It's simply not true. So but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Back to translation. So we have the interlinear Bible, really just very literal. Really, you can maybe make sense of it, but not really. And then as you come across, and here's nearly word for word. This chart says word for word, not really. The New American Standard, the King James, the New King James are all as literal as it can be really readable. You come across RSV, uh, the NIV, probably one of the most popular of all, sort of in that, in a mix of the thought for thought, tries to focus on the meaning a little bit more. Uh, the New Living is pretty popular, the Living Bible, the, the message, you know, get over into here where it's basically just a paraphrase. I'm speaking it in, in other words. So that's just a quick summary of that. But even the most literal translations over there on the left are, Definitely not word for word because the Hebrew and Greek words have different meanings. The words don't line up one for one. It's really not a literal translation, even some of the most literal translations. The ones on the, on the left tend to be a little bit less clear, less easy reading, but really good for deep study. If you want to know kind of what, what if you want to look at each word and try to get the most possible meaning, or, and for experienced Christians who understand the language and the, the structure of the Bible, the way the Bible says things, newer believers, I would say, or maybe beginning English readers, some of them more towards the right are a little bit better, easier to understand but then they do tend to lose some of, the, some of the literal meaning. And they do more of the interpretation for the reader. So when you, if, if you're reading one of these over here on the left, you need to interpret. What does this mean? You can dig in and you can study, and there may be multiple meanings, whereas towards the left, there's more interpretation. It's, it's a little bit more straightforward and easy to understand, but if those translators got it wrong, it's easier to misunderstand, too. Yes, I'm sorry, to the right. And it's often used, the ones on the left typically have a higher reading level. So like the New American Standard, for instance, is, is an 11th grade reading level. So you really need to be digging into those words. There's some big words in there that you need to understand. King James, a little more the archaic language, maybe not quite as many big words. To the right, usually simpler language, a little bit easier to understand. Probably a little bit less picturesque, loses some of the poetry, some of the, the word pictures. And then the paraphrases, the goal of those is to have the same effect on the readers as it would have had in that day. So maybe not necessarily exactly the same meaning, but if 
Jesus said something in a very dynamic way or he was sarcastic about something or used some special word pictures, they'll pick some word pictures that would have that same effect on us today. You can judge for yourself how, how good that is. I would say it's more like reading a Bible story book. So here's a little example of the, the range of meanings in, in, in Greek. So the Greek word sheris, we typically think of as grace. For by grace you are saved through faith. But also it says, uh, fear not, Mary, you have found favor with God. That's Favor is the same word. And for if you love them which love you, what thank have you? Same word. Um, praying with us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the, understand, the ministering of the saints. That gift, the word gift is that same word. So what we have to understand is there's not a one-for-one. One. We say we want a literal translation. I've heard lots of people say that. It's good in a lot of ways, but it's even the most literal translations are just not totally literal. The other, some more difficulties of translating verbal allusions, maybe similar sounding words that, that had a special effect. When you translate that, it's lost. Poetry is really difficult. Typically, Hebrew poetry doesn't have rhyme and rhythm, so that makes it a little bit easier. But still, just the flow of the words to, to bring that over into our language, especially in the, the more dynamic ones that would be more to the right, a little less literal, it's really hard to bring that poetry over. Alliteration, words that start with the same letter to, to sort of connect things, that's lost in translation. Idioms are one of the, probably the most difficult. So who can tell me what an idiom is? Not really. It's like a phrase that has a... It means something so the people would understand it. But it's right, if you take the phrase literally, it means nothing. But if you, if you know the language... So can you, who can give me an example of an idiom in, in English? Anyone? That would be, yes. Lay your eyes on something. Well, if you translate that, it's, it's say, I'm just going to say this in English, I took my eyes and put them on, the, on my notes. Well, that makes no sense. And, and every language has idioms. Greek and English are particularly strong in idioms. So, so here's John 10, 24, uh, just literal. Until when will you take up our souls? What does that mean? I have no idea. The King James says, how long dost thou make us to doubt? That's starting to get clear. You, at least you understand. Uh, how long will you keep us in suspense? That's even more clear. And so that's something very, very difficult to translate to. So do you, do you pick an idiom in English to match it? Do you, or do you translate it literally? Or do you just go with the, the meaning? These are things translators have to decide. Joshua 10.6, slack not thy hand from thy servants. Without looking at the rest of the verses, who can tell me what that means? Do not relax your hand from your servants. The ESV, it's getting, you're starting to understand. The New American Standard says, do not abandon your servants. I'm starting to understand what that means. And, and now I'm not trying to cast stones. They all, all the versions struggle with this. And, and please understand, as I give these examples, it's, it's a difficult problem. Here's some more. So the, the two, uh, King Xerxes, the two of his servants, wanted to, sought to lay hands on the king, Ahasuerus. What, what, are they, what were they going to do with him? The HCSB says they plan to assassinate King Ahasuerus. That's clear. Uh, Psalm 116. This is in the New American Standard. Upon the wicked he will rain snares. Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. Maybe that one, if you really think it, you might be able to get what it means. NIV is a lot more clear. Scorching wind will be their lot. It's what they'll get for, for what they've done. And, and th with that one, you can look through a lot of versions, and I was trying to find one that really made sense to me. The NIV kind of came the closest, but it, even so, it still, it still wasn't real clear to me. Metaphors and similes, another one. Something's like something. Something is something. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. Mm -hmm. I think I get that one. But in some of the versions that try to be a little bit more Simple for, you know, the, the, the GNT would be a very simple, easy to understand version. 
says, the Lord is my protector. He is my strong fortress. Try it. So you left behind the meaning, most, I mean, the, the direct meaning, but it's simple to understand. The CEV, our Lord and our rock, you, oh, our Lord and our God, you are my mighty rock, my fortress, and my protector. To me, that's a pretty good balance. And another verse, Matthew 6, 3. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, we're all Bible readers, and we understand that, but think of this from the perspective of someone who's young or just started to learn to read or doesn't have the Bible background we do. They're going to totally say, what is going on? And the CEV, which again is a pretty simple, less direct translation, when you give to the poor, don't let anyone know about it. It's very simple. It's easy to understand. Some metaphors are dead and some are alive. So I'm try- let me try to illustrate this. Some metaphors, when you say them, you think of what they mean, and and it's like a and, and you. But some of them are so we've used them so often you don't think of the direct meaning. You think of what they really mean in our language. So Matthew ten twenty seven says, "What I tell you in darkness, that speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops." You go to the NIV. What is whispered in your ear? But you've heard. You were with me. It was quiet. And Luke 16, 9, hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. So if you think of that literally, horns and houses. Now, I think we, as, as people who've studied the Bible all our lives, we understand that. But if you go to, if, if you think of someone who doesn't have that benefit, he has sent us a mighty savior from the royal line of his servant David. It's very, very clear. And so I think as we, as we look at the different kinds, we need to say, what are the strengths and weaknesses of each one? Euphemisms. Who can tell me what a euphemism is? Maybe our president has acquainted us with those a little more. <laughs> It's, it's just an expression we use for something that's embarrassing or we wouldn't want to talk about. It's, it's maybe inappropriate or whatever. Someone died. Who could tell me? Uh, so this is David's running away from Saul. And he came to the sheep coats, by the way, where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. A euphemism we would say is to use the restroom. It's not literal, but it's, it's, it's what we would say. The restroom is even a euphemism. Exactly. It's, it's not... It's, so we, we use a euphemism for that as well. NIV says to relieve himself. Yeah, there's different, it's difficult. How do, we, how do we translate these things? In other words, David fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers. Well, I know what that means, but do my children? Maybe. Uh, the NET says he died and was buried with his ancestors. It's just, it, these, are, these are things that are, that are difficult, difficult problems. Another thing we want to, that you want to think about, I talked a little bit about reading level. How difficult are the words? And another thing, too, to pay attention to is the number of translators. If this is a translation that one person did, the Tyndale translation, probably there's going to be some weaknesses because that person didn't review it with anybody else. If, you, if there are lots of translators, it's generally going to be a better translation. Translating money. Here's another one. This is the parable of the pounds. We call it that. You know, it didn't say pounds in, in, in Greek. Pounds is an English unit of money. And we still, it, and the value is just way off anymore because of inflation. So, so translating money, you can translate it into modern terms, but it's not going to mean the same thing. Eventually, it's going to be wrong. And um, the HCSB went with mina, which was, the, was just a transliteration. That was the unit of money that, the, that Jesus actually was talking about. The KJV says that they were talking about the tribute money. They brought him a penny. That is dramatically different today. The value, it was, a, it was actually a denarius, which was roughly a day's wages. Today, we would think it's worth very little. Now, uh, it, you know, what Jesus was actually saying is that it was worth quite a bit. 10,000 talents. Who can tell me what 10,000 talents? What's that worth? You know, is that about $10,000? You know, if I work, work for a year, maybe I can pay that off. And, and this one, I think the point is, is not that it was a very specific amount of money. It would have been 
20 years wages maybe or something like that. And some of the, the NLT, which tends to be very loose as far as literal translation, says millions of dollars. He's, it, it gives us the idea, it, it's, it doesn't go literally, 10,000 bags of gold. Well, what is that? Well, and I think that does probably capture pretty well the meaning of what Jesus was saying. It was something that there was no way he could ever, ever pay back. And it's an illustration of how the debt that we owe cannot be ever be paid back. Another one is a little bit easier than money is weights and measures. So a foot is a foot, and it's been a foot since the king time of King James. But the, the King James Bible went with the measurements that were in the Bible because they wanted to be very literal. Three score furlongs, and ASB says seven miles. KJV, 29 talents and 730 shekels. Very, very specific there. And the HCSB, I think very well, went with a very specific number, 2,193 pounds. Seems to, we get the concept real well, and I, I think, I think there's, there's some value in that. Here's probably one of the most controversial ones, the, the gender accuracy. And this one has mired the NIV with its various, the, a lot of people are really, really anxious about this one. So when the Bible talks, uses the word, a, 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 a pronoun for a man, if they say, or just says a man or he, what does it mean? Yes, all, sometimes, not always. And how should that be translated? Because most, lang most of the language other than English, and English well, used to be this way too, he could be used to refer to a person. That has changed. Well, for whatever reason, all our political correctness or whatever, when I hear he, I think it is a man. There's a story of a little girl that said, well, why would I, I don't know, she was a four-year-old girl. I don't read the Bible. It's mostly written to men. Fact is, that is actually true for the most part. But how do we, how do, we do that? How should that be translated? If you're going to, to use it, to, to, to change it literally, so for a man's ways are in full view of the Lord, for your ways are in full view of the Lord, which way is it? And then if you start doing that, when, how do you decide when? And then that's, that's leaving that decision up to the translators. And there's some controversial decisions that have been made. I think we shouldn't probably make such a big deal about it as most people do. I, I, I don't know. I, I would be open to your thoughts as to what, what you think is, is the right way to handle that. Because it makes a difference on what, we, what versions we read. Very strong experience yesterday. I was talking with a Muslim uh, girl, and uh, she explained to me she believes in the Quran, of course, we know. And uh, <coughs> she was very strong in the in believing that Jesus is not the Son of God because God is only one. There is no three. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. She said, There's no, they are not three. Because God is mighty and powerful, He doesn't need to be split on three. So I said to her, But in the beginning, there's a proof that He said, When God made a man, He said, Let us make a man <coughs> to our own image. She says, Well, that's when they translated, is then when they made this us but the original uh, uh, word is let me or let I I don't know if you can explain or is that true or well that, that's a very specific question I haven't dug into that okay. specific passage but I, my question more is to do with how should we t translate the the pronouns that are masculine that refer to everyone what, how sh what what should be done And I don't want to over overemphasize it. I, I I don't know that it's a very very important question. I think the the thing I would like to clarify though is some people have said, well, the new versions make God as as neither masculine nor feminine, and and in any commonly used version today, that is not true. The, these are these are the type of things that are changed, and it is something to, worth discussing. But I think we shouldn't all 
be afraid of every new version because someone told us that it, do, it makes God into a, a, a neuter gender being. He who believes, whoever believes, the one who believes, those who believe. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them. There is one problem there because English does not have a, a singular pronoun that is neither masculine nor feminine. So when you want to change it here, I will come in and eat with them. It changes the meaning a little bit because it makes it as he will come in and eat with us as a congregation as opposed to me individually. And it does change that meaning. So there's another little problem until we invent a new pronoun for the English language. And here's one that uh, Tyndale, where, you know, and, and, the, and the Kit and King James Version trans did change for, because he, he said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. It actually says the sons of God. So for some reason, there it went the other way. And some of the more recent translations actually use sons of God instead of children of God. So it's just an interesting thing. Next, I'd like to look at textual criticism. And can anyone define that for me? Or should I just go ahead and do that? So it sounds awful, right, that we're criticizing the Bible. It's not actually what happens. It's the study of all those manuscripts that came together to create what we translate our English Bible from, or any language, really. So it's assembling all those documents and saying which ones are correct, because there are about 5,400 documents of the New Testament alone, fragments, parts, whatever. And to, to assemble that most accurate possible text to translate from, because there are no originals, the very oldest pieces of the Bible are the 6th and 7th century B.C. written in you know, the old Hebraic language. In the late 1800s, a lot, more document, a lot more manuscripts were discovered that were actually much older than the ones they had before. So we have more accuracy that came around since some of the early translations like the King James and those that went with it. It also helped scholars understand the originals better. As they studied in, they had more to, to put together. One example is... In the Old Testament, it talks about the groves. They would sacrifice at the groves. Well, now, after having studied more documents, that's actually what was, uh, it was the name of a goddess, Asherah. It was not a, a grove of trees, generally speaking. G new Greek manuscripts for the New Testament, same way. There were a lot of those. The... The Old Testament's pretty easy. There's what they call the Masoretic Text, which has basically been preserved by Jews throughout time. And they were extremely meticulous. They would copy the whole page, and then they would count every letter on that page to make sure they hadn't made any mistakes, things like that. So there's very little controversy about the Old Testament, and they, it's much more easy to understand this is probably what, what was in the original or very, very similar. And... Yes? I heard somewhere, I'm not sure if it's true, but before they would write the word God, they would actually take a bath and wash their clothes. Mm -hmm. Is that, am I right on that? Or? I don't know specifically, but I, there was some, it was, their meticulousness was extreme. And there's stories from the New Testament too, like the, some of the monks, I read all the, how many penances they would need to do for, for anything that they did wrong while copying it. If they would get to the end of a long page and they'd been copying meticulously this whole page and then they made a mistake, they had to recopy the whole page. Well, they had to do, I think, 30 penances if they would break their pen in anger because they had done that. And so, so there was, throughout... Throughout both the Old and New Testament, there was a lot of rigor. But for some reason, early on, after the New Testament was written, there was a huge amount of differences introduced. And there, from, you know, 400 on, it was pretty consistent. But early on, there seemed to be some, a real separation of a lot of changes happened to some of the texts. There's various theories as to why that happened. Maybe it was because there was persecution, and so lots of books were destroyed. They would quickly copy them. The, the printers or the, the professional copyists wouldn't take on these jobs because it was illegal to own Bible, parts of the Bible. For whatever reason, the New Testament is just a lot more difficult. By contrast, the Old Testament, they discovered, when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found 
the book of Isaiah that was approximately a thousand years older than the oldest thing they had, and it was almost identical. So that's, that's amazing. The New Testament, though, is, is quite a challenge. They, the, what we have dates from about 200 A.D. to 1540 A.D., and, and there is not one single copy that matches any other copy out of all those exactly. Th- they made mistakes. It's pretty evident also that they, there were attempts to clarify, to make it a little bit more clear. They would also try to explain. Sometimes they'd write notes in the margin to explain what it meant. That would get par- joined in. They would conform passages to each other. So... If Matthew and Mark told the same story and, and it was the wording or the details were a little bit different, they would, they would match them up, it seems. And there was a little bit of trying to align it with what they believed. I don't think there was a lot of that, but that seems like that did happen too. And we talked last time about the textus receptus, or the received text, kind of a misnomer in my mind. But, and that was the, the best consensus of all these that was known at the time of of the early translations. But since then, there have been just a lot more documents found, early documents, and and the biggest of those was the Dead Sea Scrolls right there, right along the Dead Sea. I'm sure you've all heard the story of the shepherd boy. There's some legend surrounding that. But it was the biggest discovery of manuscripts ever of any kind. And it was 80,000 fragments of 900 different scrolls, 11 caves, some of the oldest manuscripts of any book ever found, and they were preserved there in the the desert. Fragments of all the Old Testament books, except Nehemiah and Esther, and they were from about 250 B.C. to 70 A.D. is when those were dated. And amazingly, they very closely matched. Well, this was mostly Old Testament. They very closely matched everything later. Most were in Hebrew, some were, some were in Aramaic, which is a little as a variation of that. There were also some other things. There was some commentary. There were some rules about their community. There was some uh, some books that are no longer included in the Bible were there too. There's a picture of one of the caves. So, which ones are correct? How do you decide? You have 5,400 manuscripts or parts of them. How do you put it all together? And this is a subject of a huge amount of debate and disagreement, and I don't really want to dig into that a whole lot, except just look at some of the simple rules that they use to try to understand what, what is, is the most accurate. Probably the, the biggest one is, what's the oldest? It's the closest to what was written originally. There probably were the, were the, were the, um, the least changes would have, would have been brought in. Another thing to look at is if they find a lot of manuscripts from a lot of different places, different areas that all line up, it makes sense that they probably are right. One, and this is probably one of the most controversial ones, the shorter reading is usually right. Now, a lot of people, especially the King James Only movement, hate this one, but more and more evidence says that yes, when the changes come, they're, the scribes add. They don't take things away. What that statement? When, when the scribes would copy it, they tended to add words and explanations. Like they would take Jesus Christ and make it the Lord Jesus Christ. They would, uh, add, when it was, they thought it wasn't clear, they would add a little bit of explanation. And... So, so when you hear, you know, the, that some people would say, oh, well, the new versions, they take out verses, they take out words, take that with a grain of salt because maybe those words weren't in originally. And to be really fair, most of that doesn't really affect the meaning all that much. So, so let's not get overly focused on that. But I think, at least in my mind, I, I would say it's fairly clear that, that the, the evidence would point to that. They continue to find older things, and it does seem that the shorter, seem, the more concise, is generally more accurate. So the result is what we, ha- what we call the critical text. And again, this is not criticizing it. It's, it's looking at it, studying it, and saying, here's what we believe. And there's been a lot of versions of that. But all modern versions except the New King James use that to translate from. And the New King James in the footnotes, will, when, it, when it's different or significantly different, will note it in the footnotes. This is an alternate reading from older manuscripts. And there are literally thousands of variations between these, but 
there are more di similarities than differences. So let's not get distracted by all the differences. Let's look at, at the meaning. So what, what should we do? We have all these different versions. We have all these different manuscripts. What sh what sh how should we relate? What should we do? And I think probably the, the, the number one thing that we should do is we shouldn't overthink it. This is not some huge problem when we dig into controversy. I think it's valuable to study this, but then we should, we should not overthink it. No major doctrines are, that we believe are part of any manuscript disagreement. It doesn't affect anything. And I think we need to also realize that no translation is perfect. Much as we might love the translation we use the most, it's not perfect. And we need to acknowledge that. For whatever reason, God has allowed a few things to change. The, probably the biggest thing I would say is read the preface. Your, whatever translation you like or don't like or, and understand what the goals were of the translators. In the front of your Bible is a preface. And you might be surprised what they say. For instance, the, the, one of them, the message, I think, says in the front, says, this is a reading Bible. If you want to study, you should have a study Bible, too. People criticize the message, and I, I'm not, I don't really like it either. But understand that it was not their goal for you to be able to study and dig in deep and get the meaning. It's an easy reading. It's a Bible story book. I would say also look at translations across that continuum. When you want to dig in and really study, maybe go to one of those most literal translations. When you want to, uh, you, you, sh you, should, you should read them. I, I like to have one that I read most of the time, but, but do, do look at it. When you want to study, say, what does this passage really mean? Say, what do these translators think it meant? What do these translators think it meant? And, and, and try, to, try to get that. Another thing I think even more important is read large blocks of text for context. Understand the flow of the Bible. Look at this whole book as a whole. Look at this whole chapter. Or, and, and the whole chapter and verses thing I think is a huge distraction for us because we tend to break it up that way. And if we read more than that, read more than the chapter, read more than the verse, and we'll start to understand, I think, what God's trying to communicate to us. Study the cultural background of the Bible, especially if you're reading a very literal translation. Understand, what do those expressions mean? When you come across something particular in, in, the, in the literal translations that doesn't make sense to you, study it out. What does it mean when, when uh, he slept with his fathers or, or whatever it might be? What, what, is, what is the context? What are the, the sort of implications that that would have had with it? For instance, that one, they would lay them in a cave with, on a shelf until their body decayed, and then they would put their bones, when they decayed, they'd put their bones with the rest of them. They slept with their fathers. You know, dig that out, understand it. And also, what should be your criteria for choosing a translation to use the most or the most often? I think that's a good idea. I think, number one, it should be accurate, and that's the most important, and really most of the, the common translations today are very accurate, have been translated with a lot of rigor and a lot of study. They should reflect the meaning of the original text. They should try to bring that through as much as possible. You also want to think about the style, like the reading style. Is it, is it easy to read, or is it focus on accuracy? Another thing is relevance, if you think about a translator that was translating for a tribe in Africa, and he came to the phrase as white as snow. These people had never seen snow in their lives. Is he going to choose accuracy or is he going to choose relevance? He can translate it accurately and the meaning will be totally lost. He can translate it, like he did, white as the egrets. It made sense, but he sacrificed some accuracy and you're going to need to think about that. What about uh, another one? Phylacteries. Probably most of us know what phylacteries are because we've, we've, we, we know the Bible. Some people might not. Some, some of the, more, the less literal translations will explain a little bit or, or use, use a different wording or change the meaning a little bit. I think also it should be clear. The Bible should be clear. The Bible has a lot of somewhat intentionally vague portions, somewhat difficult to understand. Even Peter said he had a hard time understanding it sometimes, so we shouldn't be too put off if it's sometimes a little hard to understand. But it should be clear. We should, I think a translation that we want to use shouldn't be too obscure or archaic, difficult to understand. 
the, you know, with archaic language, it reminds us that we're reading an ancient text that was written thousands of years ago. But sometimes we can sacrifice meaning that way. Sometimes very, very literal translation can also lead to misunderstandings as well or, or that we can't get the meaning. The other thing is we should consider the audience. If you come to, if, if you're meeting with someone that is 16 years old, didn't grow up in church, and, isn't, and, and had a public school education with reading, please don't give them anything on the literal translation. It will, be, it will not mean anything to them. Please, you know, direct them towards something that, that is appropriate for their reading level. Also, a big difference is whether they're experienced or new believers. The functional equivalent is great for new believers, unskilled readers, what we call the formal equivalent or the more literal is better for deep study for people who've been a Christian for a long time. Take a minute to look at this man. I don't know how, how to say this. I, I, it's, he was one of the founders of the King James only movement, the Benjamin Wilkinson, hugely influential. There are several other people after him too, but still today, I mean, you go to practically any Baptist church across the country and they will be adamant. King James only, no matter what, forever and always, and anything else is not the word of God. And you can correct me if I'm saying this too strongly. I believe that Satan used this man to obscure truth from Christians today in America. I, that's, that's how I feel. Maybe I'm wrong. He said that newer versions were corrupted intentionally. There was a, there was a an effort to deliberately deceive people by changing the meaning. Nothing but the textus receptus and the Masoretic texts are, ex uh, are, are acceptable and accurate, even though evidence, I would say, generally looks otherwise. He saw the King James as, I think, somewhat of an escape from modernism, which there are some bad things with that, but trying to, to speak the same language from 400 years ago is probably not not going to help that problem. So anyway, that's, that's all I'll say on that. Version since the King James. So 1881, there were a couple of minor revisions, corrections in spelling and grammar and so forth up until, but the first major revision of the King James was in 1881. It was translated largely from the, the, the critical text that had just freshly been assembled. It was actually before it was released, so that was that. Was that. They tried to stick with the King James as much as possible, keeping the word order, the language as much as possible, but they used the updated text to, to try to make it a little bit more clear. It was initially popular, but then kind of the popularity swung, swung back to, to King James again. American Standard Version, this was sort of the American version of the, of the one before it. There were two teams from America and, and England working together, and the, the American team did the, made the ASV later. The Revised Standard Version got rid of the archaic language, the these and the thous, except when referring to God, which is really, really interesting. In Old English or Middle English, where in 1611, thee and thou was, was kind of a, a common person. If I was going to talk down to you, I would say thee. If I was going to address someone respectful like King James, I would say you. And so it's, it's really interesting how that all got switched around. But anyway, New Revised Standard Version, sort of the next one pretty high reading level and it has it is gender accurate so whatever you whether you like that or not that's the way that is had about 30 translators and it it was it's sort of a balance between literal word for word and thought for thought the new king james still a relatively high reading level of 9 and if you like the King James, but you want to be a little bit easier to understand and not have the archaic language, this is a, a good translation because it reads well. If someone's reading from the King James and you have this, the, the word order, it's gonna, they try to keep it very, very close. Although, the, to me, the big downfall of this one is it does not use, it uses the old, the, the, um, the Textus Receptus, which in my opinion, is not as accurate. So, but it does at least note the reading, the the alternate readings in the footnotes. So that's one thing good about that. New American Standard, very high reading level, probably the most literal translation in the English language. And 
it's really good for study, for digging deep. Although the word order can be a little bit awkward, I don't find it that bad, but it's it's not as it's not as smooth as some of the some of the more thought for thought translations, but it's still easier to read than the King James. The ESV, another very good translation, a little bit easier to read, a little bit better style than the New American Standard, but a, but a very literal, and it tries to hard to be true to the writing style of the original writer. So Peter writes in a particular way, tries to bring that through, so we can kind of tries to be very transparent to the original text. It says in the in the uh, the preface. So that when Paul writes, we kind of get the feel of Paul writing. And Mark, he writes in a very fast-paced way, so he, it, it brings across those transitional words that some of the other ones wouldn't. Holman Christian Standard, very new, aims for what they call optimal equivalence, tries to balance those two sides, somewhat similar to the, the NIV. It's not totally literal, but still bringing the thought across. So there's, calls it dynamic equivalence, but it's... I would say a good translation. The NIV is one of the most popular modern versions, the most popular modern versions. It's, it's had a number of revisions in 2005. It was called today's NIT NIV. They brought in the gender accurate language and then there was lots of pushback on that. So then they revised it again in 2011 and took that, some of that out. So similar to the, to the NIV, but a little bit of some updates to that. The New Living Translation. This was an interesting one. Uh, probably you've heard of the Living Bible. And Kenneth Taylor, he, was t he, would, he would have family devotions with his family. And at the end, he would ask them questions, ask his children questions to see if they understood what he was reading. And they, they didn't get it. So he started paraphrasing it. And this grew out of that. He started to write it down. And this would be one where, and, and the Living Bible was one that he, that as they consolidated it, they brought it together into a, a, a paraphrase or a translation, that it had the goal to have that same impact that Jesus' words would have had. So sacrifice is a little accuracy. The New Living Translation was an, an effort to bring some of that accuracy and the easy reading style for young readers or new believers together so that people could enjoy reading it. And... They did a pretty good job for, for a thought-for-thought thought translation. It is, it is reasonably accurate. Not, it's probably leans less towards the inaccuracy. So it's um, with that. And, and there was another revision since, the, a more recent revision that even further tried to bring it to, to real accuracy with, with the original. The message, prob and I'm kind of going from, from more literal to less literal. The, the message is a paraphrase. It's not a translation. And I think we should, there's been a lot of criticism for that, but I think we should look at, again, the reason he did it. This man was a professor in a, some kind of Bible college, and all the people loved to listen to his deep philosophical arguments, and he would go deep into theology. And then he became a pastor, and suddenly his messages didn't work. They, people didn't, they didn't like it, they didn't understand it. And he said, we got to make, people weren't even reading the Bible. He said, what can we do to get people to read the Bible? And this is what he did. He made this paraphrase. And so, and, and he admitted that it was a paraphrase. And I think if we can look at it from that perspective, we can give him a little bit of room, but there is definitely what I would call inaccuracies. If, if you want to read it as a Bible story book, I think it's probably a lot more accurate than a lot of the Bible story books read. I don't know how many of you read Bible story books to your children. But I'd say you'd be a lot better off reading the message. But keep in mind, there are literally additions. I don't think it f affects the, the meaning a lot, but you wouldn't want to study this deeply. It is a storybook. And so I think if we can understand that, we can, we can use it in the right way, perhaps. A lot of people criticize, are these modern versions trustworthy? And... and the, the, the King James only people say, can we really trust these modern people that don't believe like we do? Well, I don't know about you, but if you remember the last time we talked about it, I'm not sure I'd be, want to be too much more like the people that translated the King James than these modern translators. But one thing that I am amazed at, I don't know how this works, but if you look at all the doctrines we believe, 
they're there. Even the doctrines that those translators don't practice themselves are there. They don't take them out. And so I think that speaks to their integrity. Even if they didn't believe or practice this, they brought it through. And I think for most translations, that is there. You know, what we would call the ones translated by liberal people. There's a certain level of sort of understanding and, and um, interpretation that happens. But I would say they, they did a good job at bringing it through. So I would say, yes, the, no, they're not perfect. But yes, they are trustworthy. And I think lest I put too fine a point on all this, lest I mire you down and like what's good and what's bad and make you distrust your Bible. I don't want to do that at all. I love this quote. The translation that matters the most is the translation of our lives. And are our lives translating into living for God? And if they are not, it doesn't matter what translation we use. If they are, that's what counts. We have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We have to be living out what we learn. And we cannot get overly bogged down. So any further questions, thoughts, input? I, I know this is a subject that a lot of people have a lot of strong feelings on. I, I don't know if I should say that I was blessed or that y'all were just disengaged. I didn't get lots of uh, strong rebuttals, so I'm not sure why that is. I really thought that might happen. So now's the time. You can, you can shoot my ideas full of holes. Yes. What, what makes people uh, these scribes or uh, yeah, the scribes? What makes them want another translation? You're saying why, why are there more? With all the ones we have. So or why are they trying to stay up with English language? I mean, are we going to have the Bibles after a while saying Jesus Christ loves the little kids? Is that what we're trying to do? Well, okay, you, you, you brought a couple, a couple things. So right. I would say, yes, I think that's one of the goals is to keep it up to date. And I think that can go too far. There are, there are plenty of translations that say that already. So, right? so yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the word on the street is supposed to be just kind of modern slang. And I think... That's what I wondered about the modern slang. But, but I would say to temper that, that none of those versions have ever gained any level of popularity. Any of these versions I've talked about, which are the most popular ones today, uh, do not talk like that. Yes, there are, they're out there. Yes, there are ones that make God into a neither male nor female. Whatever. There are, those are there. They exist, but they've never gained traction in any meaningful way. that you put up there because I, I told my wife you know when I just focus on the version or which version's the best I find it it, it tears down my faith mm -hmm. in the word of God but if I can look at the whole picture and what does God speak to my heart so I can bring more glory to him and how I can live a more holy life then I can find rest Yes, and that, that's one of my concerns sharing all of this. I don't want to do that, I, you know, especially for someone who was very, very strong in my version, whatever it is, is right. I don't want to tear down that, uh, uh, the, your, your belief. I don't, I, I want to, and I, that's, that's a concern of mine. It's, that's not my intention at all. We need to, I think we should study this, and then I think we should let it go. We shouldn't keep debating and strongly arguing and whatever. I, I think it's good to know, and then and then we should let it go. Another question that I have for anyone who can help to, to be prepared, I would say, the same girl that I spoke yesterday, she said that it's better to believe in the Quran that was written once than <clears throat> believing in the Bible that was modified or translated many, many times. How can we as Christians, how can we get prepared or how can we explain to someone in the future, you know, someone who comes with the same question or similar questions like that? Well, I would say, first of all, uh, then I should repeat your question, how can we defend our 
the, our Bible to people who say who dismiss it all because there are so many different translations. And there's a couple things I would say to that is all of the popular translations are very, very similar. They mean the same thing. What we're trying to do is to understand better. And personally for me, if it speaks in the language I speak, even if it's a high reading level, that's that I understand that better. But to if I think that's maybe our fault somewhat for putting too much focus on this. I don't think we should do that. And back to your question earlier about do, does the Bible say, let us make man in our image? Dig into it. Look at the look at the strongs. You can study that out. It's not I mean, obviously, I'm not a Greek scholar, but anybody, but I can look and there are plenty of tools to say, you know, compare the translations, go to a very, I would say, the easiest thing to do, pick the New American Standard. It's as literal as it comes. Does it say us? If it says us there, it probably is us in the original. If you want to dig into the Greek, you can say, what does that word mean? Does it mean sometimes us, sometimes I? Those things you can do, and it's not really that difficult. Finding Jesus, and it mm -hmm. tells us the man's journey on how he found quest answers to all those questions. It's a very easy book to read. Mm -hmm. It's very factual, and it's very... It's real. It's a story. Yeah. Seeking Mind Allah and finding Jesus. Yes. Interesting. Uh, yeah. I think that in answer to Adam's question, the, the Bible leads us to, to the God of the Bible. It leads us to Christ. But that's not what lets me know that God is real. There's an answer in my heart that is beyond description of words. And it's far more than a religion. When you, when, you, when you find Allah or you read the Quran or you just plain sometimes Christians read the Bible and never find the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And it's nothing more or less than Allah to them. And that's the difference. The, the Bible leads us to something in our hearts that answers. And, and we know that he's real beyond just the word of God. It's an answer in our hearts. It's not just because, well, God's word says he's real. No, there's something in my heart that tells me that I know he's real. I feel him there. I, I, I've experienced that life within me. And, and I think that's the difference of Christianity versus any other religion. Yeah, you can, you know, so, so the Bible is a schoolmaster. It's something that teaches us about God. It's something that brings us to his heart and teaches us about the God of the Bible. And I think that's really where we need to keep that in mind. Um, and then I would also say this too, in relation to all these, there are plenty of versions. You can take Joseph Smith, you know, and that whole thing they created the JWs have their own Bible which you go to you know they will they will take things out that don't agree with their theology or what they want to believe and I think we need to be careful about that because some of these modern versions I believe there probably are some motivations you know without having studied them all but I have seen differences in certain passages uh, with some of them so I think we need to be careful and if we choose to use a different version we, we need to make sure especially on critical doctrines that we're comparing and really studying what they say Mm -hmm. um, because there may be some differences like that. Um, like, like, can you give me an example? Well, I, I, I'm trying to remember, I think, but I think in the message, if you go to the passages about the head covering, I think there's some differences there. But I, I well, I, yeah, I, I take the message as a Bible story book. Not that's not even, and even the translate the the paraphraser right. admits this is not a translation. This is not a study Bible, and so I think let's. I, I would say that about all the, tr the other translations I talked about, not the paraphrases. The Living Bible and the Message are two that take it as a Bible story book. I'll just expose my ignorance a little. you have to help me out. What's the difference between a translation and a paraphrase? So I'm going to say your question back to you. I'm going to say, you just asked me, is there a difference between a, a, a paraphrase and a... And a translation. Yes. I paraphrase what you said to me. I didn't use your exact words. <laughs> I'm too dense. You might as well let it go. <laughs> so, 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 okay, take the message. He would take a chapter and read it. And then he'd write down in an interesting way what he read. That's not rigorous. It's interesting. It's a, very, it's a very engaging read. It's, it's very powerful. If you read the message, I mean, it's... it's what you call paraphrase. Yes, that's a paraphrase. Now, the New Living Translation took a paraphrase and tried to make it into a translation, and they did a pretty good job, but it still leans that direction. So I wouldn't use that as a study. But any of the... The Living Bible and the, and the Message are the two that are in common use that are a paraphrase. The New Living Translation tries to ride that fence. Still pretty good, but I wouldn't use it as a study Bible. 
The rest that I talked about, I think I would feel reasonably comfortable saying you're not going to find doctrinal things changed, uh, things like that. They're going to they're going to say the same thing. I think it all comes back to the same thing that Clem brought out. You know, you know, and it affects even a lot of our own people from from the Anabaptist type people. You know. It's so easy to have just a plain down um, relation with the Bible, and that's as far as it goes. But God wants us to have a relationship with Him. And I don't care what translation you you read or you think this might be better than the other. You know what? If all you have is a relationship with the Bible, with plain down written word, the Bible, and you can be so you know, staunch about it, but if you never have a relationship with God himself, what is it, well, I mean, what is going to profit? Yeah, and I think, I think that, that, that is some of the damage that I would say with some of the King James only movement, the Bible, you know, you know, I've seen preachers hold, this is the word of God. Well, I, I'm going to take issue with that. Now, I understand probably their motivations are right, but I don't agree with that. And I'm not trying to tear down the Bible and its place, but I, I wonder sometimes if we haven't exalted it too much in some ways. I, I don't know. I want to be careful about that. And to me, if somebody can come to a, a real relationship with God himself, they might have read, they might have grew up reading a paraphrased Bible. It was like, whoa, wait a minute. You read a paraphrased Bible. You know, that wasn't right. Well, wait a minute. If he found... Mm-hmm. If he came to a real mm-hmm. commitment to Christ and a real relationship to Christ, mm-hmm. hey, mm-hmm. what's wrong? There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I, I wonder about, and I, I, you know, looking at the the motivation of you know a paraphrase to get people engaged in reading the Bible. What's the path forward from there as a believer? I, I question that a little bit. So you, you have this very exciting, lively read, and then you say, all right, now as you're growing, it's time for you to start digging in a little bit more. You know, I don't know. I'm not, how does that work? I'm not, I'm not sure. D- does that work? And so it's, it's a question, but I think just dismissing them out of hand, let's understand what the goal was before we get too harsh. I have to think of the song. We sing quite a lot. Well, I say a lot. Uh, uh, and, and what that really means, the verse in the song says, beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. Mm-hmm. I had to think what Pete said. Um, there's something like having the word and being able just to quote it and expound on it and whatnot, but never having the heart of the message. Mm-hmm. It's beyond that sacred page. I mean, I'm afraid almost to say that, but there's a truth to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it needs to go beyond beyond reading. Go to our heart and relationship. Lastly. Yeah, um, going back to what Abner was uh, talking about there with paraphrasing versus translation, uh, an analogy that I thought of that might help to clarify that also is if we play the game of whisper down the lane, what happens at the end? Is it a paraphrase or is it? <laughs> and um, that's at least a partial explanation of that. Mm-hmm. The other thing was, um, I was thinking of as Pete was sharing here is it's true, and I agree that, you know, really, at the end of the day, does it really matter with translation an individual read if they've, um, if they've achieved the relationship with Jesus that we, that we all would lift up? But I do think that there is a balance there also because I think sometimes, you know, the tendency can be, and it's just a, 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 I'm going to say it's a human tendency, that we want something fun to read. We want something Mm -hmm. easy to read. We don't want to put the effort in, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And I think the trap there is we can fall into, well, you know, some churches nowadays, or so-called churches nowadays that are, are doing, and they're bringing in entertainment to draw people in. You know, and I think I think there's a balance there. We need to be careful that we aren't just seeking some entertainment in our reading, um, right? And not, and and sacrificing on another front. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I you know, d- d- 
that's that's a, a, a question I, I don't necessarily know the answer to. I'd just like to share one thought. Um, uh, in in the order of the assembly, in in Corinthians, it says, "Let one prophet speak, and the others judge." And in another place, in Thessalonians, it says, "Despise not prophesying; mm -hmm. prove all things." So there's a place for a person to, to dig deeper and have the more literal translation in his hands so that when this young Christian comes along professing Christ, he can judge. <coughs> because I don't think the Spirit of God in that young Christian <coughs> can contradict the more literal translation. Right. But if, if a person's not rooted in the Scripture and you can't judge a person's Jesus, then you're, you're bound to be swept along with something other than the truth as well. Mm -hmm. So I believe there's a place for us to be rooted and grounded in Christ, which typically comes from, a, you know, a deeper stuff. <coughs> and, and to accept that young one that, that came to the light in the message or whatever other translation, but also encourage them to be rooted in Christ so that they wouldn't be swayed by every wind of doctrine. Mm -hmm. Yes? I don't think there's any law against learning Greek or Hebrew. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't uh, had the discipline to do that yet, but when you do that, I will respect you a lot <laughs> for that. I do anyway. Those are two requirements they have. You need to learn Greek. For the express purpose of understanding God's better. Uh, one comment uh, or question I would have is I remember when I was a young man that the Reader's Digest came out with the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I just looked it up. It's still available. And that was one that people were really alarmed about mm -hmm. and were really pushing back on. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to listen here and search a little bit, wasn't able to. But um, if I remember right, that was the one that took the blood out. I'm not sure. I can't remember. <coughs> but it was one anyway that there was a lot of pushback. Mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts on how if something new comes along? How do we work through that exciting new uh, introduction? Any thoughts on? That? So your question is how do we look, how do we evaluate a new translation? Well, okay. I, there's two things I would say is every modern translation especially any that, that go by the critical text, are gonna, there are charts, like here are all the things that got taken out. This concept, look, over and over, the Lord got taken out and said it, it just says Jesus instead of the Lord Jesus. And, and so I think that's the wrong way to look at it. You can make an impressive list yeah. if you want to do that. But what you really should look at is what... So, or one that's a popular one, the deity of Jesus, you know, because there are certain places where that's missing. But if you look at it fairly and say, what does this translation say about the deity of Jesus? All of those, and I, again, I'm talking about the, the, the five or so that are very common, very popular. They talk about it everywhere else. It's full of it. They just found a few spots where because of you know, again, in my opinion, a scribe added it somewhere, and they didn't. And, and, and now it's now it's missing. Doesn't mean that they they tried to take the deity of Jesus out or the blood. That's that's another common one. Yes, maybe it's missing a few places, but does if if someone was indeed trying to change that, they would have tried to obliterate it everywhere, right? Well, that just isn't the way it is. Yes, Jonathan. Uh, back to Adam's question. The other part of his question is the Quran, uh, well, I mean, how do you feel about it? The Quran is not the Bible in my book. But what do you have to say about that? The same thing I'd say about all the other books. You've got to evaluate them against what the Spirit says and against what the Bible says. Does it line up or doesn't it? There are lots of books I have read that have been very helpful in my Christian life but I'm always going to be critical of them as I go through. Maybe not critical in a bad way, but I'm going to say, does this line up to what the Spirit says, and does it line up to what the Bible says? But I don't believe it's a translation of the Word of God. I don't think anyone would say I mean, 
Yes, it's well, it's a Bible. I don't think it even compares to the translation of the Word of God. I don't consider it that anyway. No, I don't think it's, that. It's more like a book, like you say. I mean, like, there's lots of books. Mm -hmm. yeah, just an interesting note. Uh, just recently, they just, they realized that the Quran was also modified. Oh. Oh. They actually there's there's uh, different pictures available and different other old philosophers are not the right word uh, translators perhaps that actually acknowledge that. And so when you get this strong pushback, this book was never touched, realize that that is Mommy. true. Now, I would, I would caution against putting, using that as an argument to them, but rather encourage them to look to, uh, to, look to Jesus, because Jesus is clearly mentioned in their Bible as a prophet. So if you use that as an angle, okay, well, Jesus is mentioned in the Quran. He is mentioned as a prophet. Because the dilemma they have is when they acknowledge someone as prophet, that means what they spoke is true. And then you can take them to what Jesus said. And then the that causes things for them to consider that is part of their structure. And yeah, I think that's excellent. That look at Paul did that. But, you know, he said the unknown God. He took them from where they mm -hmm. were mm -hmm. to where he wanted them to be to, mm -hmm. and led them towards truth. One of the things that I find very comforting is the fact that Bible and history, God has always been faithful in revealing himself to an earnest speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Cornelius, Paul, on the way mm -hmm. to Damascus. You know, we can go through all the different things. God will be faithful if you are earnestly seeking him. And Lord, what will God have with you? I want to please you. He will be faithful in showing more perfectly you know, his will. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing that I love about the Bible, and I hate to simplify it too much and get to a point where everything is translated and the job of the you know, translator is already figured out what God wants to tell me. Mm -hmm. um, because of the fact that as you grow in your Christian life, you read the Bible, and God reveals new things to you that were not there before, that becomes much more difficult if the translator has already interpreted it down to a level where it's, mm -hmm. there's no there's no additional um, understanding that can come as, 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 you, as you get into it. So I'd encourage you to be cautious of that. To keep the Word of God something that is sacred and important to us, and we do it carefully. And when we go to other versions, one of the things that you know, we can try to compare it, but we're never going to compare all thousand, thousand pages that we have. That's not what realistic to do on every version that comes out and catch details that are wrong. We do need to be careful about changes and be careful about adopting a new version very, very quickly that hasn't been thoroughly edited. Because there's many mm -hmm. things in there that we wouldn't see, um, that we wouldn't catch and we wouldn't really study it and we would get a, a wrong notion. So I think there's, there's reason not to change every other week. Yeah, I, I think stability is good. I would say, too, usually if there's a brand new translation, there are almost always several revisions because people do what you're saying. They do study it out, and they say, here's what's wrong with it. And you'll see that repeatedly. New version comes out, and same with the King James. There were a lot of revisions. You know, there was the Wicked Bible, and the, you know, they all, and there have been revisions since, too. Yes, Anthony. I don't want to take away from the importance of studying the Bible and digging in because that needs to be our foundation, but I think it's important that we live a life that's led by the Spirit. I want to read John 16, 13, and 14. Jesus was speaking here about the Spirit coming, the Holy Spirit coming. Mm -hmm. Verse 13. How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, mm -hmm. He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. Verse 14, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. And there have been Christians in countries that are not able to get the Bible, that have lived holy lives. Mm -hmm. And it is very important for us who have the word to dig into it. The Holy Spirit needs to be our guide. Mm -hmm. Well, unless anybody else has anything pressing, I think I'm going to close. Yes. yes. So how would you uh, explain about this question that, you know, why God needs to be in three different uh, ways, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, <coughs> instead of just being one God. I don't know if that has so much to do with translation. That's more of a, of a theological question. Mm -hmm. I am not a theologian, so I guess you have to ask Abner that question. <laughs> can, I, can I say one thing? 
Sure. life and that text will feed the life but the answer is the life of Christ to to the argument to these people in dead religion and they will not know how to respond to that and you can get caught up in all these little technolo technologies and it'll just always end in in argument because whoever can argue the best or know the most verses but that's just just a thought to share it's a different angle Adam but Talk about the life that's in Christ. Amen. I heard a man uh, a preacher somewhere.